I'm Minister Patricia Venus Henry. Join me every Sunday right here on the Tobago Inspirational Network at 9.30 p.m. for Stepping on the High Waters. Stay tuned because God is turning things around for us in this season. Good day, and we are so happy to be in your homes again uh, today and tonight. And welcome to Stepping on the High Waters. I'm sitting in for your host, uh, Minister Patricia Henry. And um, I'm Pastor Rex Henry, and we are here talking about um, today about some spiritual things. And you know, whenever you see me alone, we're talking about um, pneumaticos, things of the spirit. And um, we want to welcome, uh, we're in the kind of in the midst of a series where we're doing on men. We want to encourage and strengthen men. And um, my mind kind of went back to uh, something I read in last week, during this week. A, a teacher was teaching kindergarten children, um, very young children. And a mother that was uh, sitting in the audience, and she was listening to the teacher tell the boys and girls that every major problem that has ever taken place in the world, the wars, the destruction, took place because of men. Men are the problem and women are the solutions. And the mother who was there felt so heartbroken for the boys who were in the class because the boys all looked dejected and broken down and hurt and the girls were looking so proud and stuff. And she was, she was very, very concerned and she was saying, who is saving our men? Because who are the girls gonna grow up and marry and be a part of and, and stuff? Most families have children, they have boys, they have girls, and men and women. And so the church has to be concerned about balancing the, the story because many times I found in my family, my wife has been such a great blessing to me that she's such a tremendous treasure. And um, at times I have found that um, as a husband, I was required to hug her and hold her and protect her from some of the pain that life throws at you. And so uh, we, we appreciate that we need each other literally need each other. So in the last few weeks, we would have been talking about men-related issues, and my host, um, my guest, uh, two guests, didn't, wasn't able to make it with, with us today. So again, welcome to Stepping on the High Waters, and today we're going to go into the Word of God in the book of Romans, chapter 1. And in Romans, chapter 1, we're hoping to unlock some secrets, uh, some thoughts, and in this discussion, if your men are there and you're uh, children are there. We're hoping to kind of challenge our minds because I'm not going to preach at you. I'm going to have a talk with you. And I want you to begin to see the mind of God that was finally coming out in Romans. The idea of um, Romans chapter 1 where Paul says um, from Romans chapter 1 verse uh, 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because of the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. One of the, the things about this, and, and we would seek to welcome that God would bless his word and the ministry of his word and um, bless his presence in your homes. And if you're joining us, we are Stepping on the High Waters. Um, it's a program by Minister Patricia Henry, and I'm sitting in for, for her. This is Apostle Rex Henry, and we are here bringing the mind of Christ to the nations, to the communities from the island of Tobago. But here's what we're saying. Paul is saying that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's a message of salvation to everyone that believes it. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And, and what God has been trying to tell us in this scripture that is, that is so fundamentally important is the idea that 
faith, which Hebrews chapter 11 says. Hebrews chapter 11, in the discussion of faith, begins to begin to speak to the idea that faith is really your ability to see. Faith is your ability to obey a vision and to pursue it. So he's, Paul here in Romans chapter 1, as compared to Hebrews chapter 11, in Hebrews chapter 11, he says that men of God moved by faith. Now, faith is not just we want stuff. Often enough, believers want stuff. We all want stuff. Better life, bigger car, uh, healing for our bodies. We're all kind of about, we're trying to get stuff. And for most of the time, our faith is kind of zeroed in on the stuff that we want. In the book of Hebrews, faith is not so much about getting stuff. Yes, you, the needs were being met and stuff were being done. But faith in the book of Roman, of Hebrews was all about moving people from here to there, to a place called there. A place called there is, is biblical language. It's the idea that there is a thing to, to move from to. It is a, a change of circumstance, a change of situations. It's about moving a nation from point A to point B. Abraham looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker was God. Living by faith for Abraham was an entire journey, was a lifetime journey, a lifetime journey in which God, in, in the, the expression of Abraham's faith, gave Abraham a commitment for 400 years that his children would have been in Egypt for. And then God then gives him a promise that God would bring him out, bring his children out in the fourth generation. And then when God calls uh, Moses, God is speaking about a span of time, uh, uh, a period of the time in which God moves the children of Israel for 40 years. But for, for Moses, the journey of faith is an 80 year journey before God is actually bringing him into divine purpose. And this is important to understand because it is important to understand that the salvation message that's found in Romans chapter 1 is talking about moving people from faith to faith. And I think that's important to know. It's important to know that when God is moving you from faith to faith, we need to have and grasp and have an understanding in our minds that faith is not just about a thing. It is about a movement. It's about moving a person from one level of understanding in divine purpose to another level of divine purpose. So that the concept of faith is not just the concept of possession. It is the concept of positions of understanding in your walk with God, in your relationship with God, in your intimacy with God. It is about the level of which you can understand what God requires of you and of your children and from your parents and maybe your grandparents, that this has always been a part of a journey. And that sometimes for many ministers, the, the, for many people, the, the, the journey um, could not be seen in your natural parents because of circumstances. And so sometimes we attach ourselves to mentors, fathers, if you will, fathers in the faith. Uh, Paul wrote one way one in Corinthians, he says, you have had many teachers, but not many fathers. And so the, the journey of faith, the journey of, of moving from faith to faith, he says that the righteousness is, of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, righteousness is right standing with God. So how you stand with God, your relationship with God, your, uh, uh, project, your program of God, your uh, uh, moving forward with God is directly linked to, um, to what you believe is required of you. And later on in Romans chapter 1, Paul then digs deeper. Paul says, because what is known of God is revealed to them, he says, when they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge, God gives them over to vile affections. So what he's saying is that the journey of God, the will of God, the purposes of God, the agenda of God is something that God is trying to reveal to everybody. And he's saying that there are sometimes groups of people, individuals, even among us, who is refusing to accept this God-given agenda, this purpose. Let, let me go a little further. He says that because they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to vile affections. And at that point, he goes in to talk about the, the rejection of, of women of men and the rejection of men of women. And he talks about how people begin to pursue their own desires for their same sex and things of that nature. But I want to pull us back a little bit. 
he's saying that the problem didn't begin when people began to act out their deviant behavior. He is saying that the problem began when people should have been moving from faith to faith. One platform of revelation of faith, one level of, of grasping what God has called you to do, one uh, level of understanding your role and responsibilities. Now, now let, me, let me put it another way, my beloved. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates human beings and gives them assignment. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. That's God's assignment. God is doing that with plants, he's doing it with animals, he's doing that with fruit trees, he's doing that with everything. God is trying to get humans to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion. And he says that which should be known of God is revealed to them. So God made man in his image and in his likeness and gave them dominion. So that the male man is representing the fatherhood of God. The female man is representing the Holy Spirit in the earth. And between both of them, there is that accommodation with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the seed of God. And the seed is the word. And the term word has to refer to the ideas, the purposes, the intent, the vision, the direction, the message, the um, declarations of God. All of those things are what sons embody. And we who are the sons of God, um, the Bible says, know ye not that ye are the sons of God. And therefore, if you are the sons of God, and I am sons of God, and that also includes both male and female genders, if you are the sons of God, and I am the sons of God, then we are the embodiment of word, of God's ideas, of his message, of his thoughts. So that's why your life is a message. My life is a message. Our Children are messages, our neighbors are messages. We're all a message of God in the earth. And then we have to be careful what our message is meant to say. So God is saying that because that which should be known of God is revealed unto us, revealed unto everybody. Everybody knows that God's intention is for human beings, animals, plants, flowers, fish in the sea, birds in the air, that God's intention is that we all be fruitful, we multiply, replenish the earth, we subdue it. But he says that in our societies will arise people who refuse that agenda. They don't want what God has called them to do. They want to do something else. And they want us to believe something else. They are determined not to comply with this agenda. And so what God is saying is that because what should be known of God is revealed unto them, he says that because they don't want to retain God in their knowledge, he said there comes a point in time where God releases them into their vile affections, empty affections, useless affections, affections that do not bring forth any purpose, any intent, any completion, any growth of the society, any impact. And so that in any society, you will have people practicing a certain kinds of, of practices that are destructive. They're thieves. They know that they should be using their hands, run a garden, grow some animals, encourage plants, flowers, fish, etc., etc. There are things that they can do, but they don't want to do that. They want to thief. They want to steal. Uh, another example is people who want to kill. They know they should be promoting life, but because they don't want to retain God in their knowledge, they understand that if they began to think about God, they would know that God doesn't want to kill. But they set out to kill anyway because of their drugs or because of their territory or because of their property or, or whatever thing they think or they think they want to take from that person what that person possesses or that person is in their ways preventing them from accumulating all the, all the carnal stuff that they want. Um, it, it is the idea that knowing a truth and rejecting the truth and that is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that a society will be built when a truth is known and the truth it begins to be um, followed. A society is destroyed when a truth is known and the truth is ignored. It's rejected. And so God is saying in Romans chapter 1, because what, what is known of God is revealed to them, God gives people up to vile affections. God hands you over to your empty intention. Murdering is going to produce lifelessness in your life. Stealing lifelessness. And in this chapter, he goes on to say, abandoning your uh, relationships with the opposite sex. 
can lead to an emptiness in your life as well. And he's saying that in this emptiness, this, the same-sex approaches, he says, lead to even further complications down the road. And he says, because you're abandoning this relationship that God has created for you, he says he cannot. Now, this is important for us as believers to understand. Believers often jump on, their, on our religious high horses, and we um, want to condemn particular groups of people because we think that their sins are so far more heinous than all the other sins that we have. I, I want to take a point and kind of bring us down to it. Fornication, which is the idea of um, prostitution in the body of Christ, fornication is the act of um, selling yourself, either for a job or selling off your vision. And when the Bible talks about fornication in the New Testament, there's an interesting story where he uses Esau. And he says, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. And I want to get that to your attention because believers may feel that the homosexual thing is worse than everything else. I want to correct you. Sin is leaving God's plan and standard and behavior for our lives and pursuing after something that is destructive. Anything that deviates you from a faith work is destructive. And when he uses fornication, he's using a really good example. He's using an example that is attempting to say that when God spoke to Adam and Eve, God told them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Eve lost her assignment because Eve was convinced, somebody came along and convinced Eve that she was being tricked out of her equality. So somebody says to you, don't do what God's called you to do. He tricking you. It, it is an oppression and thing. I've heard it said most often that the family unit is a unit that was created by history to oppress women. And so many women abandon the opportunity to be married. They abandon having children. They abandon being in a home. They refuse any kind of submission to their husband because submission is a kind of wickedness they believe and stuff. And then later on, they get to be in their 60s and their 70s, and they're sitting in an empty house. They got the house they wanted. They got the company they wanted. They got the cars they wanted. They got the cat they wanted. And they're sitting in an empty house, and they're realizing, I missed it. I was working some years ago at a hospital, and um, late at night after midnight, I was listening to CNN, and um, somebody called in, and a lady, and she was saying, I, became, I, I graduated as vice president of my company, and I abandoned all the things women traditionally went after, and I got to the place in my life where I got everything that they said that we would get if we didn't pursue family life and marriage and that kind of thing. He said, she says, I'm here. And there's nothing here. I got the house, got the car, got the cat. Um, I have the wealth. I was top of my company. And after getting all these things, I feel very lonely and alone because things did not give her life fulfillment. So I want to go back to what Romans 1 is saying. Romans is saying that the same thing can affect men, prostitution. And by prostitution, I mean if you engage somebody for the purpose of having your physical needs met without a purpose for that person, you are a prostitute. And you have sold your destiny and purpose. If you raise children and leave them out there in the, the rain for the wife to mind, mind them by themselves or the woman to mind them by herself, you're a prostitute. You're a fornicator. You've abandoned purpose. Esau was called that fornicator, not because he had been sleeping with many women, but because his destiny was sold to, to Jacob because he was hungry in that moment and he didn't understand the value of a blessing. Our society today has abandoned churches. We've abandoned our communities. We've abandoned relationships with God because we no longer see it's purposeful. Many churches are people don't want to give any kind of tithe anymore, one-tenth of their income, because they want to control it after they give it. If I can't control what the pastor is doing with my money, I'm not giving the money. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that God set up a system, just like he set up the household, just like he set up marriage, just like he set up the assignment of being fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. God sets those systems up. 
when you abandon those systems for whatever reason, and I'm not saying that your pastor is spending money correctly or your husband is behaving properly or any of the other things that, that does make you feel justified. Eve felt justified that God was tricking her. Adam was tricking her. It was only when she did what satisfied her that she realized that she was being tricked. The Romans believed in Zeus. They believe in Apollos. They believe in, in um, uh, uh, these gods and goddesses that were there. And I was giving a study to, to what those were. And if you study those things very closely enough in the Roman Empire, you realize that those things they worshipped very, looked a lot like Lucifer, the fallen angel, and Lucifer bad-talking his father, Father God. And he, the, the, the story of the gods and goddesses of Rome paints a picture that, the, that the, the father of Zeus was ugly and evil and wicked and that Zeus was a good guy, bright and full of lightning and thunder, nice and stuff. But behind that story is the story of Zeus as the fornicator, the guy who comes down from the realm of the spirit and sleeps with women and other men's wives and all that kind of story and creates all kind of conundrum, which is the kind of thing that, that our knowledge of Jesus Christ and his father would never have condoned. The idea that the Lord Jesus Christ and Father God would never be leaving heaven to come and rape any woman or trick any woman, that kind of story. So that story of what the Romans worshipped, many times people want to reconcile all worship systems that being equal. They are not. What the Romans worshipped in Zeus and, and uh, the wife, Athena, and all of those people are more akin to the activity that the book of um, the, our Bible tells us resembles what the fallen angels did. The book of Jude tells us the angels who left their first estate and went into the daughters of men and produced giants in the land who um, ate flesh, human flesh, and that kind of thing. That is what that story of Rome, Rome is telling us. That, the, that they worshipped were Satan embodying himself like an angel of light coming to bring solutions to human society, but at the same time possessing the kind of behavior that is destructive. So what I want to say is, how do we as people, men and women of God, understand that the intention of God is what is of faith? If you can believe that God called you and gave you an assignment to raise healthy families, to manage the natural world around you. If you can um, manage the natural world around you without that management of the natural world around you, you are not, you and I are not um, going to experience, you and I are not going to experience the graces of God, the power of God. And we are not moving from faith to faith. Because faith is not just a belief in a system today that makes you go to church. That is not the kind of faith Romans 1 is saying. Romans 1 is saying that faith embeddies the idea. It's embedded in the idea of what is your righteousness, your right standing with God. Your right standing with God is embraced by everything that is involved in the idea of your worship how you walk, how you conduct yourself. And in the book of Romans, he's actually, Romans chapter 1, he's actually saying that, that the ideas of God is guiding your uh, reproductive behavior, it's guiding your socializing behavior, it's guiding your value systems, it's guiding all of those things. And it is because of that, um, it's because of that um, guiding system um, that you we use now we're here we're stepping on the high waters and we're 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 dealing with walking in the realm of the spirit as believers so let's focus on what, what we want to do because we as in, in the next few minutes let's come back to that faith is not just your belief in God giving you stuff we're, we're, we're surmising faith is your whole pattern of living with God Faith is your complete pattern. It, it has also has to do with men and the women, their rules and responsibilities and representing God in the earth. All of that is your faith, right? Now, 
God is saying that I move people, God moves people from one level of mission and assignment and purpose to another level. So he says the righteousness of God is revealed by faith to faith. So every level of understanding you have with God is what is needed to move you to the next level of understanding with God, the next level of revelation. It's very, very key. And once you catch that, you'll understand that. He is saying, though, that there is a tendency in us to pull away from what God has already made clear to us. And that this nature of rebellion against God and pulling away from what God has called us to do causes us or tempts us at times to... Um, rebel against what God is doing in the earth. And when we begin to pull away from what God has made absolutely clear as his purpose, we get caught up in a second problem, which is that God hands us over to that vile of it, that empty purpose. In other words, faith is being filled with, full with purpose. Vileness is when purpose, it becomes empty, right? So he says we're all likely to do that it, whereas Romans 1 goes on to focus on the issue, use the example of women who are pursuing after women, men pursuing after men, he ends up with a number of other sins that are caught up in that too as well. And that's why we use the word prostitution or fornication as, as, as we commonly call it, because what we want you to understand is that purpose can be aborted if you're not clear. When purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So, um, we're stepping on the high waters with, with this program. And what we also want to bring to you the understanding is that there is an impartation of spiritual gift, giftings that leaders bring. We all need to have in our lives mentors. We don't submit because those mentors are perfect. We submit with those mentors because they have something to give to us that we're going to use. Paul says, I wanted to impart to you some kind of spiritual gift to the end that you would become established. So right now, I want to pray for those of you who want to reach out. We want to welcome your commitment both to TIN and to this program. Uh, Minister Patricia Henry, uh, stepping on the high waters. I'm sitting in for her. I'm her brother, uh, Pastor Rex Henry. And um, we want to encourage you to uh, minister to, to, to her and to the program from, and to the station uh, some of your physical gifts so that we can continue to keep this program on the air and this station on the air. So let me pray that God will impart to you a spiritual gift. Father God, we just want to thank you for uh, my sister, my brother, who's sitting out there and looking at the program. And Father God, we pray, God, that, that the impartation of the anointing will now break forth where they are. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance. We break every yoke, we reverse every curse. And we declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father with the absolute destruction of every devil. We want to bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next time. And Jesus Christ is here.